Hello and welcome to probabilistic machine learning lecture number 23. In the last two lectures we took a brief detour from this uh, applied problem that we're currently studying to have a look at a related but slightly different class of inference models or generative models called mixture models. We started this conversation with a look at an even older algorithm, a clustering algorithm called k-means. We convinced ourselves that one way to think of k-means is as performing maximum likelihood inference in iterative fashion in a Gaussian mixture model. So this means that uh, we have, uh, we're dealing with data that is assumed to be generated by uh, several different Gaussian distributions where each datum is assigned to one and only one such distribution. So we first realized that the EM algorithm constructs a maximum likelihood estimate for this model. So it constructs a point estimate, both for mu and sigma and pi, the three variables defining the parameters of this model. And it does so in an iterative fashion where each iteration inside of the loop consists of two steps that alternate with each other. We also understood in the last lecture why we have to do things this way. That's because in this graphical model, the, even the likelihood, so that's the conditional distribution for x given those three parameters, is of a relatively complicated form. And one way to understand this is to look at this graphical model and see that um, if you think of these parameters as variables, that these observations create a collider structure. So observing this data leads to a conditional dependence between all three parameters, mu, pi, and sigma. To address this, one way, one which at that point seemed like a relatively ad hoc thing to do, to uh, introduce is to consider an additional latent variable z, a helper variable, which assigns, which is basically a, 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 variable, a way of writing down the uh, fact that each of these observations x is assigned exactly to one such cluster and considering the value of these variables. The reason that this is helpful, and this is actually not immediately clear from this graphical model, is that if we introduce this variable, then it turns out that if we would know the value of this uh, latent variable z, then the resulting joint likelihood over mu, pi, and sigma actually is of a relatively simple factorizing form that we can optimize in closed form. So I say that this is not entirely clear from the graph because if you just consider these two variables, then this doesn't, of course, remove this collider structure. But this is instead a property of this specific model, of the structure of this model, that um, provides us with easy to optimize distributions over pi and mu and sigma because pi becomes independent of mu and sigma in this specific model under this particular choice when conditioned on z and vice versa. Pi, uh, mu and sigma become independent of pi when we condition on z. We, like one um, sort of intuitive way of uh, thinking about this was that there is a sum here inside of a log um, in this likelihood that is not easy to optimize and by introducing this variable z we can write the joint log likelihood as a product and when we take the sum both of these, uh, sorry, when we, when we take the log then both of these products go outside and become one big sum instead of leaving us with a log over a sum. Now k-means actually really commits to this kind of structure. It, it doesn't even have this parameter pi, it just assigns these indicator variables z called responsibilities in a hard fashion to every single datum. What we realized in the last lecture is that we don't actually have to be this extreme and we can still get a tractable algorithm even if we consider this latent variable pi. And the, the trick here is to not assign the z values in a hard fashion, but instead consider the probability distribution, the predictive distribution for z given the, a, a, a particular point estimate for the parameters, mu, pi, and sigma, which we subsumed into a variable theta. Compute that, we saw that we can compute these quantities, they actually show up naturally in um, our optimization problem, and we can call them responsibilities. They are now not binary variables, but um, variables that are of the form of a probability distribution, so they are discrete numbers between 0 and 1 that sum to 1. And then, instead, um, we can maximize the expected value 
of this complete data log likelihood. So instead of setting set to a particular value and then maximizing in theta, we compute an expected value over this quantity of under this distribution for z. And this gives us an additional sum. So there are really, like for every single j, there are um, uh, non-zero values here in the sum. And this could, of course, be a problem, but actually it turns out that, that for this particular optimization problem, it's still fine because each of these quantities in here can be easily optimized. And if you have a convex combination of them in this form, then this optimization problem doesn't become particularly harder. We realized at the end of the last lecture that this algorithm is uh, actually just a specific example of a more generic type of algorithm that applies in these kind of settings and it's called the expectation maximization algorithm because it does exactly this. It computes an expected value of some distribution that we can construct and then maximizes this distribution as a function of its parameters. So we ended with like, phrasing um, this EM algorithm in this generic form. It's an algorithm that applies to situations in which we're trying to compute a maximum likelihood type estimate where this maximum likelihood um, uh, problem is hard to solve in closed form because if you compute a gradient of this expression with respect to theta, we can't just analytically write down where the root of this gradient is. And the EM idea now, and this is, this is why it becomes a tool in our toolbox, is to say, let's see if we can invent a latent quantity, a helper variable, like um, this z in our case, which is this indicator for which datum belongs to which cluster, such that um, this expression would be easier to optimize if, well, first, if we knew what z is, or maybe it still remains easy to optimize if you compute an expected value over the logarithm of this joint, rather than the logarithm of this marginal. So, like a very... Like, simplistic way of phrasing this or a little oversimplification is if you could only take this sum out of the log then things would be easy right let's see if we can do that so um, if we can do such a thing then the EM algorithm or if you can come up with such a structure then the EM algorithm consists of iterating in a, in a repeated fashion over these two steps where we uh, each, where we first compute the predictive distribution for this latent quantity z, given both the data and our current parameter estimates, and then maximize, hopefully in closed form, but we'll see actually we don't have to do this in closed form a little bit later today, then maximize this, um, the expected value of the complete data log likelihood, so this, this expression without the sum, under this predictive distribution. And if we can do that, then we can repeat this process, wait for convergence, and call this the EM algorithm. Now, what we're going to do today is to take a closer look at this algorithm. Here is the gray slide on which the last lecture ended. And we'll first try and understand why this algorithm is actually a good idea and why we can expect it to actually converge at a maximum likelihood solution, so at a local maximum of the actual log likelihood, the marginal log likelihood, not the complete data log likelihood, but log of p of x given theta. And when we do so, that will give uh, first a beautiful connection to a larger class of algorithms and actually provide us with uh, the final very powerful sharp tool in our toolbox. To understand why this algorithm is a good idea, as a first step, let's look again at this quantity, this predictive distribution or conditional distribution for the latent quantities, the explanatory variables, given the data and the parameters. I introduced this distribution arguably in an ad hoc fashion. I mean, it's maybe the natural distribution to think about, like what do we believe about those latent quantities given that we have the data and the parameters. But beyond this nice interpretation, so far we don't have a strong motivation for why this is exactly the right distribution to integrate over, to marginalize against. Uh, to see that this is a good idea, or to do things this way, I will uh, first show that actually no matter what distribution we probably put in here, as long as we put any probability distribution over z, what the EM algorithm then does, so maximizing the expected value under this any distribution Q, is actually an interesting idea because we can show that this raises a lower bound on the quantity we care about, which is the log likelihood, 
And then we'll realize why this choice is a particularly good choice. So let us consider any arbitrary probability distribution over our latent quantity Z. In, our, in the specific case of EM, we decided to use this predictive distribution. But for, for the argument that follows, this is enough. It's just any probability distribution over, Z, over Q of Z. We could call this an approximation for whatever we want to assign to Z. Now first we'll see that for any such approximation, the quantity that we are maximizing, which is the expected value of the complete data log likelihood under Q, is actually a lower bound on the quantity we want to maximize, which is the log likelihood. To see that, we'll do like as follows. So let's write down the quantity we want to maximize and introduce our latent quantity Z. This is easy. We are always allowed to do this by the sum rule. And now let's assume that our approximation has the very mild property that it's non-zero wherever the joint is non-zero. Then we are allowed to multiply by one inside of the integral without accidentally dividing by zero. And then we apply a wonderful result, which is stated down here. I'll explain it in a moment. It's called Jensen's inequality and it's widely used in analytical works on not just machine learning. I'll first tell you what it says, then we look at the theorem, and then we give a picture of what it does. The theorem says, if you exchange the order of the logarithm and the integral, so you drag it inside here, inside of the expectation, then you get a lower bound on the quantity. So if you do this, we can drag it in here, and this is the quantity that, um, like this quantity is then a lower bound on this quantity. And now if we, if we maximize this expression with respect to theta, notice that this isn't quite what we're maximizing there's, because there's this over, like one over Q of Z in here, but that's not a problem because Q of Z doesn't depend on theta. So if we um, add that in, it's just a constant, right? It will just get the, in, the expected value of the log of Q of Z, which is like the negative entropy of Q of Z, but it doesn't depend on theta. So if we maximize this expression, we're maximizing a lower bound on this expression. So what does that theorem again? It's called Jensen's inequality. And it states that for any probability measure over some probability space, in our case, that is Q of Z over the space of Z, so the probability space consists of the space Z and Q as a probability measure on it. That's our mu here. If G is a real valued integrable function, in our case, it's this function, this ratio, and phi is a convex function. So we're actually not going to be using a convex function. We'll use a concave function, the logarithm, but that's fine. It just switches the sign around and the inequality, the direction of the inequality then this property holds. So applying the convex function to an integral, to an expected value under the probability over the function Q, a G, is less than or equal to computing the expected value while we apply the convex function inside of the integral. So the picture for this is, here is a probability measure. Um, who actually is a random variable g, which has a distribution under mu. Let's say the distribution looks like this. This is our convex function. Then you can sort of visually imagine that if you take this probability density and apply this convex function, then this convex function, because it has a higher derivative over here, when we apply, when we do the change of measure rule, right, there's over here, there's more stuff being pushed upwards because the function is more rapidly changing. So we'll get more concentration of probability mass in higher regions. And therefore the expected value of this distribution will be lower than the expected value of this distribution, which is sort of shifted upwards. In our case, we're applying a concave function. So everything's exactly the other way around. Everything, every plus turns into a minus and a less than turns into a larger than. That's why we have our lower bound here. So in EM, when we make a particular choice for Q and set it to this predictive distribution, when we um, maximize this expected value of the complete uh, data log likelihood, then what we're doing is, as we just saw, increasing a lower bound on the log likelihood, this expression. So you can imagine if you're thinking of a a, a particular value for our data log likelihood, 
the marginal data log likelihood, what we're doing in EM is we're constructing a quantity that is below at, to, at or equal to the value of the log likelihood. And now what we're doing in EM is that we're raising this quantity. We're pushing it up. So it's, um, that sort of sounds like a good idea to do, right? Because if you're pushing up a lower bound, maybe if you're lucky, you're also pushing up the actual log likelihood. But of course, it's not a guarantee that that will really happen. Because we might just be increasing this lower bound without it ever touching the log likelihood. So to make sure that we are really increasing the data log likelihood when we are uh, maximizing the expected complete data log likelihood, what we're now going to do is, is that we'll see that this particular choice that EM makes, setting the Q of Z to the predictive distribution for it under the data, that that actually is the optimal choice. This makes the bound tight. And if the bound is tight, then by raising the bound, we're also raising the data log likelihood. To see this, um, here's another slide that is full of math. So um, I've written down this lower bound again. So I, I always have to be a bit careful when I say this, by the way, because there's two different names for this. In the context of EM, this is the expected complete data log likelihood plus the negative uh, entropy of Q. We'll quickly so find, and I'll just say it out now so that I don't get too confused, that this is also a lower bound on the evidence, and that's why it's called the evidence lower bound, and that's the name that is actually uh, commonly used, the elbow. So I'll get to that in a moment, but if I sometimes confuse it, and in particular, if I sometimes say the expectation lower bound later on, it's because of this situation here. So um, this quantity that I just defined on the previous slide, let's see if we can play around with this a little bit. So first of all, we have a joint up here, and we're doing an integral over Z, so it might be a good idea to split up this joint into a quantity that, that depends on Z and one that doesn't depend on Z. We can do this using the product rule of probability theory. I've done that here and written a predictive distribution for Z given X times a marginal for X. You can already see that this is the quantity we will eventually use, so that's very convenient that it shows up here. Now we notice that we have one expression that involves Z and one back here that doesn't involve Z. So we can use the functional equation of the logarithm to pick that out and we'll get this expression, right, which is the um, expected value under Z of the, um, the predictive distribution divided by Q plus something that doesn't depend on Z, so we can drag it outside of the integral. And the resulting integral is just the integral over Q. Now Q is assumed to be a probability distribution, so its integral is just unit. Okay, so we can just pick that out. Now if we just saw what we just realized now is that we can just rearrange this equation, right? We can drag this, uh, this term to the left-hand side and keep this on the, on the other side. Then we've just seen that the thing that we're trying to maximize, the log likelihood, so this is the function we care about as a function of theta, can be written as this thing we just introduced, this lower bound, minus the expected value under Q of the ratio of the log ratio between P of Z given X and theta and the approximation Q of Z. So maybe you notice that this is actually an expression that um, we've encountered before. We encountered it in lecture, I think 15 um, on uh, exponential families. And back then I pointed out that this quantity is called the kullblatt leibler divergence between Q and P of Z given X and theta, with e including the minus. If you go back to that lecture and remind yourself, you'll find that the, it's called a divergence because it satisfies two important properties. This object back here is um, always larger or equal than zero. It's always a non-negative quantity. This is called the Gibbs inequality this relationship. And this is, of course, um, just a reassurance, a reaffirmation of what we just already know, which is that this is a lower bound on this. So therefore, the distance between this quantity and this quantity has to be a positive number. However, maybe here in this context, this is the more important uh, statement. This quantity is zero if and only if Q and P are equal to each other almost everywhere. Well, m 
mu almost everywhere, where mu is the base measure over z. So that means in a specific case of EM, even though we didn't realize that we were doing this specifically back then, when we make the concrete choice to construct an approximation Q that is equal to this predictive distribution, we are effectively setting this term in our equ equation to zero because we're setting Q equal to P. And that means that this quantity here, this evidence lower bound or the expectation of the complete data log likelihood, this is actually not a lower bound on this quantity, it's exactly equal to this quantity. At the particular location theta that we're currently considering. So here's another visual story on what EM does, another recap of what happens in EM. What we're trying to do in EM is that we're maximizing this quantity, the log likelihood. We now have realized over the past few minutes that we can write this log likelihood as the sum consisting of a lower bound and a um, positive number, necessarily, otherwise it wouldn't be a lower bound, called the KL divergence between Q and P of Z given X and theta. They are here, these two quantities. So what EM does is in the E step, so when we are constructing this predictive distribution for z given x and theta, we are actually setting at a particular value theta the um, lower bound equal to the uh, marginal likelihood at theta. So that means we're actually making the bound tight. And then in the m step, when we are maximizing this ex expression with respect to theta, the other quantity, we are raising this bound by something. And because it's a lower bound on the uh, log likelihood, and at the moment, the point where we start, the log likelihood is, a ti is tightly bound by this bound, we also necessarily have to raise simultaneously the log likelihood. But because we are changing theta at this new point that we are going to, the bound is not necessarily tight anymore. We now have a new value for P of Z given uh, x and theta at this new theta, theta uh, i plus 1, if you like. And therefore, our previous approximation, so P of z given x and theta i, the old theta, that here, this gap is not necessarily zero anymore. So when we go back, when um, EM now updates this or resets this Q to P, then this bound gets tight again and the process can, can repeat over and over again. So to really drive the point home, let me rephrase again what I just said, but maybe show it to you in the slide that I've used so far for EM, as a summary for EM. So we can think of EM as an algorithm that iterates between computing a posterior distribution over some latent quantities and optimizing the model that produces those, uh, post this posterior distribution. So it's kind of doing simultaneously Bayesian inference and hierarchical Bayesian inference. From that point of view, we can think of this quantity as an evidence for this model. So consider the posterior over Z given theta. The, in that application of Bayes theorem, the, 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 in, in the denominator, you would see this term, so without the log, and that's the evidence. So what EM does is it iterates between computing the actual posterior for Z in this model, this posterior given the particular model parameters, if we plug it into, well, we can think of this as, this, this as a choice which like, sets the, the KL divergence between an approximation for Z and the actual posterior to zero, that's kind of a, almost a tautology because the KL divergence is zero whenever their two parameters are the same. But when we do that, we can then compute this interesting object L, which is from this point of view could be called the evidence lower bound, or it's also up to a constant, the expected value of the complete data log likelihood. And that lower bound, we can then raise, optimize in the M step to increase the, the quality of the model, by, to fit theta better, basically. So this really is kind of an iteration of you know, Bayesian inference of the type that we've discussed several times before. There is a model 
parameterized by theta, and it has latent parameters called z. So what we do is we compute the posterior for z. This requires us to compute the evidence, basically. Then we raise the evidence and we compute the posterior again. At this point, I hope you now have a better grab, grasp for what EM is. We'll add EM to our toolbox, not without noting a few interesting aspects. So if we want to make EM a tool for ourselves that we want to uh, use in various applications, here are three kind of insights that might be useful to have. So the first one is that whenever we apply EM, it's still, again, a really good idea to have in our model that we designed, our probabilistic model, exponential families lying around. Why? Because they tend to make the optimization easy. We already saw this in the Gaussian mixture model when we made this particular uh, choice, when we introduced, introduced Z in this particular way and used Gaussians as the representation of the clusters and uh, a discrete distribution for pi, both of which are exponential family distributions, we saw that the optimization is particularly convenient. Even though this may have seemed like a lucky coincidence, there is something a bit more structured to that. By our choice of exponential families, by you, the, 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 the idea, the decision to use exponential families to represent the distribution over the data, um, is usually a good one, not just in Gaussian mixture models. Why? Well, if you think of a, a generative model where the predictive distribution for x given z is an exponential family, so it's parameterized by theta in the form of an exponential family, sorry, x and z, the joint model, then um, our elbow, our evidence lower bound, is given by, well, this expression, right? So that's the expected value under Q of the log um, of this exponential family plus a constant, right, the negative entropy of Q. Then um, because we take the log, right, the exponential goes away and what we're left with, and this is really the beauty of exponential families all over again, is an expression where theta enters linearly in the term where x and, theta show, uh, x and z show up. So our expectation under Q over this expression, of course, doesn't affect log of Z. We can just take it outside of the integral and it doesn't affect theta. So we can take theta outside of the integral and we're just left with an expected value under Q of the sufficient statistics of our uh, exponential family. Now, of course, that in itself doesn't guarantee yet that we can solve this optimization problem in closed form, but it often, often leads to optimization problems that are of closed form. Why? Because if we take the gradient of this expression with respect to theta, well, clearly here theta is just going to drop out because it enters linearly, right? Um, this quantity might be something we are lucky enough to be able to compute. And if we can, then the only thing that might hinder our progress is what the shape of the gradient of this log normalization constant is. And for many practically used exponential families, we know and we've seen this for Gaussians now, for discrete distributions and so on, that those gradients have a relatively elegant form in the natural parameters, theta, and therefore can be solved in closed form. So, long story short, again, when you're building your graphical model, when you're writing down the generative process for the data that you want to use to model the data you're working with, it's generally a good idea to use exponential families as the base types, as the first choice, the first attempt to um, you know, parameterize your probability distribution because it tends to make your life easy. A second insight that is also useful to extend our, how um, how powerful EM is, is to maybe point out that we can use EM not just to maximize the likelihood, the evidence, so the likelihood for x given theta, but also to maximize an a posteriori estimate for theta given x. So to construct a map estimate, maximum posteriori estimate for theta um, given x. Why? Well, because everything operates on the log and when we add a prior, this really just sort of runs all the way through. So maybe uh, that was too high level. Here is what I mean by that. If we are doing um, um, EM, then let's just look at what happens if we care about the log posterior. Well, we could take our um, evidence lower bound, this expression that we're maximizing, and just instead of considering the likelihood for x and z, the complete data log likelihood, we could consider a complete data log posterior, if you like. 
So we just multiply by a prior here. Um, that's the posterior up to normalization, and the normalization doesn't depend on, th on theta. Then, um, um, now if you think about what happens here, there's an integral over z, and of course that doesn't affect this uh, prior because it enters in the log. So we can just write here plus log of p of theta times an integral over q of z dz, right? Which is one, because q of z is a probability distribution. So we can um, just as well maximize this expression, right? But just as well, I mean, if you already know how to compute the gradient of this thing, you get to choose the prior over theta. And then, of course, you can add its gradient to whatever gradient of the elbow you've already computed. And then follow that. And when you do that, you're effectively maximizing log of the likelihood plus log of the prior, so log of posterior. So if you are having problems with EM, if it doesn't work in practice, the most common issue is that this likelihood is um, it's just not properly defined. It just has some, some pathologies. Maybe it, um, it diverges or it uh, isn't, you know, it's just not properly regularized. Maybe it's, it's also... Um, it doesn't have a unique minimum. And then what you can do is you just add a log prior and that you're essentially constructing a log um, map estimate. And the adding this prior is a really simple thing because you just have to be able to write it down as a function, compute its gradient. You don't have to be able to perform integrals. And by the way, this doesn't invalidate the previous point. If you're using exponentially, exponential family distributions for your model, that in the hope of getting a tractable um, uh, expression for the optimization problem, you might still get maximum likelihood estimates at awkward points. But then there's also a very natural prior to choose. It's the um, con conjugate prior for your exponential family distribution, which always exists, as you know, from the lecture on um, exponential families, that conjugate prior might not be completely tractable as a probability distribution, but it doesn't have to be because you only need its logarithm. You don't need to have the normalization if you're just computing a map estimate. So, but what do you do if you somehow end up with a model where this optimization isn't tractable, where you can't just compute the, the exact minimum of the negative log likelihood or the exact maximum of the likelihood or posterior in this kind of fashion, or actually the exact maximum of the elbow in this particular fashion, well, then actually it turns out that you can still use EM and you can just numerically optimize this um, evidence lower bound. So why is this a good choice? Well, there's a final slide on this. So um, notice that the um, KL divergence which is the difference between our lower bound and the quantity we do care about optimizing, this KL divergence is minimized if Q equals P. So if we optimize the evidence lower bound, this curly L, then eventually we will reach a point where, so what, what, what we'll do is one of two things. Right? or maybe both of them simultaneously. Either we're making the KL divergence smaller or we're increasing the log likelihood. Eventually, like if the former happens, if we, if we are small, making the KL divergence smaller, eventually we'll reach its minimum. Its gradient at that point will be zero. And then the gradient of the lower bound has to be equal to the gradient of the log likelihood. So by, keeping, by following it, we are now necessarily increasing the, um, the actual likelihood. So what you can do is, right, you just compute this quantity, the lower bound, compute its gradient by automatic differentiation, and then just follow that gradient. If you do that, sooner or later, you're bound to also increase the log likelihood. And when this optimization terminates, so once you've found a zero, a root of that gradient, you are necessarily at the um, mode of this expression. Right, and with this, we have a new tool in our toolbox, the EM algorithm. It's a tool that you might want to whip out if you're faced with a maximum likelihood type problem where you want to find estimates theta that maximize the likelihood 
over some model and this maximization is not of a particularly simple form. So you can't just write down what this likelihood is and then maximize it in closed form. Instead, we introduce a bunch of latent variables such that we are able to compute the posterior, if you like, over these variables given the current value of our estimates for the parameters. Now notice that in contrast to how we usually do Bayesian inference, these variables Z that we introduce here, they are purely, at least for the purposes of EM, they are purely for algorithmic convenience. They are not necessarily the quantities we actually care about inferring. Arguably, we are caring about inferring the values of theta, the parameters. So, for example, in the Gaussian mixture model that we looked at, Z were the cluster membership variables, the, 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 the relationships between which datum comes from which cluster. Those weren't so much the quantities we cared about. What we really cared about were the shapes of the clusters, and those were in theta. Nevertheless, we found that introducing this nuisance variable, if you like, that is really helpful for maximum likelihood inference because we can compute a posterior over it and then the, well, a, a tautological statement to make, seemingly, is that, sorry, that this um, posterior minimizes the KL divergence, this Q, this provides an approximation, approximate distribution for Z that minimizes the KL divergence to the uh, current posterior, that's maybe tautological, but what this also means is that this choice maximizes a, um, or tightens a lower bound on the log likelihood at the particular value theta that we're currently at. And then by raising this lower bound, we are also necessarily, because it's a tight bound, raising the log likelihood. And if we now then go back and recompute the posterior at this new choice of theta, we'll tighten the bound again and we can then update the log likelihood again. And here I've actually, I mean, this is maybe a typo, but it's also actually maybe the right choice, right? The, I've called this a lower bound an expectation. It is a lower bound and it's also an expectation under um, Q, where Q is the posterior for Z given X. And that's why this algorithm is called the expectation maximization algorithm. It iterates between computing an expected value under the posterior for Z and maximizing that expression with respect to theta. Now we'll add this tool to our toolbox. It's a piece of machinery that we can use to perform maximum likelihood inference in complicated generative models where this is not so straightforward. Notice that to do that, we have to look really careful at the model. We have to come up with these latent quantities, Z, that make optimization easy. So it's not the kind of thing that you can very easily automate. You typically have to provide a lot of structure to the algorithm to get this right. So it's again an area where a skillful human operator is key to achieve good performance. At this point, we could spend some time implementing EM for various models, but I'll actually not do that. Instead, I will uh, want to skip ahead because I really want to complete our toolbox with one additional tool. And the convenient thing is that this additional tool, which will be called variational approximations, actually is a direct generalization of the EM algorithm, at least from the point of view that we have now taken. And Therefore, it's relatively easy to add. It's just another little thought on top of what we've already done today. We'll do that now, but maybe here's a good point for you to take a quick break, and then we can continue on. Okay, so I hope you've had your break. <laughs> to get to this final tool in our toolbox, here's a thought process. So we, we encountered the EM algorithm as a way of finding maximum likelihood estimates for models that involve some parameters theta and some data x. We did this by adding latent variables z, which we didn't care about. We just used them for numerical convenience as nuisance parameters and set the approximation to the actual posterior of those nuisance parameters. Now, maximum likelihood is an interesting like 
estimate to construct, but ideally, of course, we want to have Bayesian estimates for everything. So we would like to have a posterior over theta, not just a maximum a posteriori estimate for theta, because I pointed out that we can, of course, use EM to compute map estimates. Now, we'd ideally really like a probability measure over theta as well. So let's say that we subsume our theta into Z. We just consider theta as part of the variable Z. And our goal will be now not to compute a maximum likelihood or maximum a posteriori estimate, but actually a posterior over Z, which now includes theta. Now, unfortunately, the price we'll pay for that is that, in general, we won't be able to compute the posterior over Z given X anymore. Because the model will just be too complicated to do that. So, for example, in our Gaussian mixture model, it was clear to us that we can't compute in closed form a full posterior, an exact posterior, over all the cluster distributions and their assignments to data because that, those wouldn't have a simple parametric form. Now, this challenge, this uh, fact that we can't compute the true posterior, this was the original reason why we did the M in the first place. Actually, it turns out, though, that we can use the same mechanism we just used to maximize the likelihood. We can use that also to construct an approximate posterior for those latent variables set. So let me go back to this picture for EM, maybe. So here in EM, we, we said, let's, let's repeatedly construct a distribution Q over Z and make it equal to the posterior because then this, town, this bound is tight and then we can maximize this function as a function of the model parameters, theta, to increase the um, evidence, the marginal likelihood for the model. Now, we can, when we do that, we can use the exact same expression and instead try and find, like use the same mechanism to try and find a good approximation Q given that the full posterior is intractable. So we could also say, let's keep the model constant. So let's not change theta, the parameters of the model. Then um, this here, this L is still a lower bound on a constant. And that lower bound the distance between the lower bound and this expression is the KL divergence between the distribution Q we're dealing with and the true posterior for all the variables set given X. So what we can do is we can try and come up with some way of introducing a family, a space of approximate distributions Q and again maximize this lower bound, but this maximization will now be the actual part of the effort, the actual, like the, the key part of the algorithm. It won't be a simple, straightforward thing we just write down. And when we maximize this lower bound, we are then going to naturally try, well, we're going, then going to make this gap as small as possible, right? Because this is going to be a, a, a constant. So when we make this gap small, then we're minimizing the KL divergence between the approximation and the true posterior. And that's also a good thing because that means that the Q we're getting out of this process, even though we're not actually raising the red bar, will be as close as possible in the sense of KL divergence to the true posterior. And maybe that's something we want because then the resulting approximation Q will hopefully be, well, it'll be good. At, it'll certainly be good in the sense that it'll be close to uh, the true posterior in terms of this KL divergence. Uh, this process, this idea is called variational inference in machine learning or minimizing variational free energy, at least it used to be called historically. Um, why is that? So uh, before we get into the details of the algorithm, let me maybe make a bit of a historical connection or a, a technical connection to where this algorithm historically comes from. Let me just find the right slide again. And here it is. So um, this, this whole idea hinges on the, the, this insight that we've already been using for this whole lecture, but that I maybe have to state again because we're now sort of switching focus a little bit. It's the same equation as before, but we're thinking about it in a different way. So we've realized that any probability distribution over some variable x, which we can think of as data, the logarithm of this p of x can be decomposed into two terms. If we introduce 
an arbitrary distribution Q of Z over some latent quantities Z that are assumed to be related to X through some generative model P of X and Z. This decomposition states that we can write this P of X as the evidence, right? P of X is the evidence in this model. We can write the log of this evidence as the sum of the KL divergence between Q of Z and the posterior over Z under the generative model and this lower bound, this evidence lower bound, because it's a lower bound for the evidence, the elbow. We can think of Q as a model that we are constructing. And what we do when we maximize the lower bound is that we minimize KL diversion so we get our model Q as close as possible to the true posterior that it really should be. We could also have defined this quantity L with a minus inside in front and then it would be something that you wouldn't maximize but minimize uh, that's maybe more convenient for the framework of optimization. It's also the typical way in which uh, physicists phrase this, this kind of process. And then the negative value of this L, of this lower bound, is, which is an upper bound, right, um, is, is called or is associated with the term variational free energy. The reason for this, as far as I understand, is a very deep old connection to uh, modeling in physics. So um, going back to basically all the way to Newton, physicists have, have used the, the word energy as something that is being minimized, as something that is dissipated uh, by a system, that energy is sort of naturally lost until the, until the system finds a state of lowest energy. Historically, this was originally used for, for simple mechanical models, but then very quickly, or maybe not very quickly, but in the uh, late 19th, early 20th century, when physicists increasingly started to model complicated systems like um, thermodynamical systems and fluid dynamic systems and, uh, and solid state um, systems, they used energy as a representation of the quality of their model. They, they encountered a situation where they had to model the behavior of something that was overly complicated. It was too complicated to do on a piece of paper. And in the late 19th century, of course, people didn't have computers. So what physicists di did was to build statistical models of the systems that they were dealing with and describing their behavior as minimizing some energy, which we now today maybe can connect to the idea of finding an approximation to the actual behavior of the system that gets as close as possible to the true posterior of like the state that the system that we should really the state of our knowledge of the system the statistics of the system if we knew everything about the system and we could really write it down so this idea of free energy it's really sort of, it's actually kind of, it, I think it has changed its role from a law of nature that, is, that, that systems always minimize energy to the concept, a word that is used to describe a mismatch between, the, between reality or under some generative model and so the, the true posterior and a model, an approximation that can be constructed in a tractable fashion. So across the, like, uh, the, timeline of physics, various great physicists like Helmholtz and Gibbs and Boltzmann, these are all people that are associated with thermodynamics and statistical physics, came up with various ways, various models that describe the behavior of a thermodynamical system typically in terms of some simple basic statistics like um, potential energy according to some Markov random field of how particles are interacting with each other and the entropy of the system or the, or the relationship between pressure and volume of the system. And then they said this, the actual state that the system um, finds is the one which minimizes free energy. And that means it minimizes the difference between what, we, what really actually happens and what our model describes as what really happens. In machine learning, which is maybe the contemporary continuation of the, the modeling process that physicists, that physicists started 200 years ago, more than 200 years ago, we can actually use a very similar kind of idea. We can say there, there is a system that, or there is actually a true posterior for the, the, the quantities in the world that we would like to compute, but we can't describe it with our computational tools. So instead, we're going to find an approximation which gets us as close as possible to the true posterior in the sense of 
minimizing hail divergence between the approximation and the true posterior, and which is equivalent to maximizing the lower bound. So here I'm putting uh, David Bly as a placeholder for machine learning researchers these days. He's not arguably, probably not the inventor of variational inference as such. It's very difficult to pin that down to one person. Other names that we could certainly mention here are uh, Chris Bishop and David Pekai and various other people. I'm sure Michael Jordan is also involved. Um, but I think David Light um, is actually probably the inventor of the term elbow, the evidence lower bound. So I'm going to use him as a placeholder here and um, I hope that that's fine. So. In machine learning, in the connection, so that actually the reason I'm showing this slide is that I believe there's a deep connection between what we do in machine learning these days, when we do in particular probabilistic machine learning, and the work of physicists in the past, which is that we're building models for the world and trying to tune those models such that they predict the true, the real reality of our world as much as possible. And we do that by constructing probabilistic generative models, and then numerically inventing algorithm that find approximate posteriors or point estimators for them. The difference between machine learning and the kind of physics that these fellows here did is that we have access to massive computational power that these people didn't have historically, and we can use those to build much more powerful, much more elaborate models. Now, this may have seemed like maybe a bit of a chaotic historical detour. Maybe it was. But um, the connection to physics actually will stay with us for the remainder of this lecture. But for the moment, let's go back to what we're trying to do. Let me summarize the idea that I've proposed. In our toolbox, we've already collected various algorithms that approximately, in a numerical fashion, get us, give us an estimate or something that is related to the true posterior arising from a generative model and some data. What we're trying to build here is a new such approximation, another one. And this approximation is based on the following insight. If we have a generative model that connects some latent quantity Z to some data X, then we've realized that there's this, al this algebraic trick that allows us to write the KL divergence between any approximation Q of Z, so that's a probability distribution over the latent variable Z, to the true posterior under the generative model of for Z given, given X as the, um, an equivalent maximization problem, where instead of minimizing the KL divergence, we're maximizing this evidence lower bound, the elbow. And we know from the case of EM that this evidence lower bound might be easier to compute under Q than the KL divergence itself because it only involves not the posterior over Z, but the log joint. So the logarithm of P of X and Z. And maybe under our Q, that's an integral that we can actually solve. So one thing we could do, a first idea would be to write down a, um, to make a hard decision which approximating Q we're going to use. So for example, I could say Q of Z should be a Gaussian distribution, which has a mean and a covariance. Um, or maybe I even fix the covariance, right? We could do something really crazy. And um, um, I uh, to, to hope that, I, I just hope that I'm lucky enough and I can compute the, this evidence lower bound, so the the expected value under this Gaussian approximation of the logarithm of P of X and Z. And then if I can compute that as a function of the parameters of my Gaussian, the mean and the covariance or whatever I want to choose as, as parameterizations, then I can compute um, a gradient with respect to this and optimize for it. Now this idea exists, it has a name, it's called parametric variational inference, but we shouldn't adopt it yet. It would be a bit of a knee-jerk reaction and it would be getting ahead of ourselves. Imposing an explicit structure for the approximation we're going to construct, Q, to decide that it's Gaussian, for example, is actually not always needed. And it turns out that it's sometimes possible to find an approximation w over a large space of probability distributions without explicitly stating what that family is in terms of a set of parameters. 
And this idea is um, based on a really beautiful framework called the calculus of variations. It's one of the grand ideas of uh, applied mathematics that you don't learn about in school. Um, maybe it's, it's as important as differential calculus, but it's rarely taught. It's connected to, again, a bunch of physicists. So I told you that the phys physicists will stay with us. Um, Leonard Euler, uh, Lagrange, and then even Feynman, who uh, y y arguably got his Nobel Prize for using it in the uh, development of quantum field theory. I'm mostly just showing these faces to uh, explain that this idea goes back a really long time. That is a very powerful idea that has survived over the, the centuries. The fact that it's still relevant today probably means that it's going to stay relevant for um, uh, at least a few more decades, so long enough for your career, maybe. And instead of doing a large like, foundational introduction, we're going to um, like, do it, like, use this idea directly in the context of our machine learning problems. And it goes like this. So, let me go to the right slide. So we have our uh, generative model, P of X and Z. We want to construct an approximation Q of Z that um, maximizes the elbow, or it minimizes the KL divergence to the true posterior under our generative model for Z given X. Now, if we don't impose any constraints on what Q might be, then we know exactly actually what the best fit is. The best fit is the one where we set Q of Z to exactly the posterior, P of Z given X. But we know that, well, we assume that we can't compute that. If we could compute it, then we wouldn't have to have this conversation in the first place. One thing we could do is to impose and say that, that Q of Z has a particular parametric form, that it depends on a bunch of numbers in the following form. For example, it's a Gaussian distribution. But that's a too extreme a step. So instead, let's see if we can find, or it turns out that we can put a vaguer form of restriction on this distribution, this unknown distribution Q, and still get a closed form tractable answer out. And a really powerful way of imposing such a, such a restriction is to only require Q to factorize in a particular fashion. So what we're going to assume is that there is a Q of Z that we're looking for. We want, to, want it to minimize the KL divergence to the two posterior. We're not going to say what Q actually is, but we are saying there, is a, there are certain sets of variables in our latent variables. So, that, so we, can, we can take the, the set Z of all our latent variables and um, group it into subgroups indexed by I. And we want Q to have the property that we can write it as a product over these individual terms. That's all we want. And now what we, like, let, let's see whether this might get us to a structure that actually tells us what QI is without having to write it down explicitly. So let's write down our um, evidence lower bound, L of Q. So this is just the, the, the remember that, that L of Q is given by the integral over Q over the log of the joint divided by Q. Or if you use the properties of the logarithm, uh, that's the logarithm of P of X and Z minus the logarithm of Q. We impose our factorization structure. We've decided that Q should factorize in this form, so we get a product here. And in the logarithm, we get a sum, of course. So now let's pick out one individual variable J, or one set of variables within Z that, are indexed, that is indexed by J. If we, if we focus on this particular subset, then um, we can exclude it from the rest of the product. And think of this first expression here as an integral over qj times all the other terms in the product. So those are all the i that aren't j. And the corresponding integral, because of this factorization assumption, becomes, can, can be dragged inside, right? Because, um, well, I mean, we can just, just first do those. We can just do those first and leave the integral over the, the, the zj as the outermost kind of summation variable. And in the back here, we then get, uh, for the same kind of separation, we get one term 
where we get an integral over qj log qj dzj and then a bunch of terms where we just get integral over qi log qi so uh, that that's just a constant it, has, it doesn't have anything to do with qj or we get an integral over qj log qi and that's actually also a constant because well log qi doesn't depend on qj so we can take it outside of the integral and we just get an integral over qj dz which is just one because it's a probability distribution so these are the remaining bits that actually depend on qj and the rest is just constants now, if we look at this expression here a bit carefully, we see that it's actually a marginal, a marginal over, well, it's not really a mar it's not a marginal, it's an, it's, an, it's an integral over, or it's an expected value, sorry, it's an expected value of the log of the joint under this approximating distribution qi over all the other variables. So what this means from a functional perspective is that all of these are integrated out and what we are left with is an expression that once we've done the integrals only depends on zj. So we could write this down uh, using this kind of notation so we could say there's a, there's a p tilde, some other function that isn't actually, well it's not log p, it's log p tilde of some other function that only depends on zj. You can, you've maybe already noticed that this is kind of related to the idea of message passing in a graphical model where we, we are constructing messages by summing out all the other bits and then sending it as a function forward. If you'd like to know a bit more about this connection, ask me about it in the feedback and we can talk about it in the flipped classroom. There's actually a notion called variational message passing that is exactly this. So um, we're, we're left with a function that only depends on, depends on zj and now we can just look at this expression and see if we can make sense of it and maybe you've realized already that the expression we see here looks a bit like a KL divergence. Like a KL divergence between QJ, only the subpart QJ, and this sort of constructed approximate distribution P tilde of just ZJ, right? It's only a function of ZJ. Now this is a very powerful insight because we actually know how to minimize KL divergences and we know so in closed form. We don't have to write down some uh, iterative process anymore. We just know where this, uh, this functional KL divergence is minimized. It's at exactly this distribution, P tilde of ZJ. So let's, build, let's use this insight to construct an actual algorithm. An algorithm that constructs an approximation to the true posterior for Z given some data X under this generative model by minimizing the KL divergence between the approximation Q and the true posterior without actually saying what the explicit form of this approximation is supposed to be, the only assumption we're putting in is that Q has this factorization property, that it provides independent distributions under this assumption. This algorithm works as follows. We initialize somehow so some, with some initial distribution Admittedly, this step is a bit weak. We'll see in practice that this is actually often not a problem. And then we iterate between the individual variables and iteratively compute the elbow, the marginal evidence lower bound, so the lower bound on P of X, or actually log P of X, under the approximation, specifically for this one, uh, for the local variable, set of variables, ZJ. We just saw in the previous slide that we can write this elbow, this evidence lower bound, in this form. And we realize that what we, just, what we see here is a KL divergence between our approximating distribution Q and some implicit probability distribution P tilde of ZJ. It of course depends on the data, but it's basically a P tilde of ZJ. Now, we don't have to do this minimization manually, if you like, but we can actually, we actually know what the distribution is that minimizes this uh, KL divergence. It's P tilde. So if we can find a probability distribution, QJ star of ZJ, such that it's log the logarithm of its PDF is equal to this function, then we have found the quantity, the, the distribution, the local 
the, the factor in this approximation that minimizes the KL divergence. And now notice this expression here really is a function of ZJ. It's not a value of that function at various points. It's an entire function. So it actually might uniquely identify this approximation without us having to write down what, like in, in how, how uh, um, QJ can be written in terms of some parameters. It's, it's, exa it's already an entire function. It is the logarithm of a probability distribution which minimizes the KL divergence. Now, if we've done that for ZJ, then we can keep iterating over all of the individual terms in this approximation and keep like, coming back to it in a, in a while loop. Now, it'll turn out, and this is something I'm not showing here, that this iteration will actually converge. It will converge because this elbow can be shown to be a concave function or is negative value a convex function in the space of all functions Q, all probability distributions Q. This approach of optimizing KL divergence between an approximation and the true posterior in a um, non-parametric form, in a so-called variational form, by optimizing the entire function as one, is perhaps the uh, most general form of this class of approximation uh, techniques called variational inference. It is also connected to a, um, or sometimes also called actually in the machine learning literature, mean field theory, because it arises from an analogous idea in physics, where we model the behavior of a multi-body system, so many particles together in uh, interacting with each other through some potentials that each individual particle has by modeling the behavior of such systems um, as uh, separate independent distributions, so like as terms in a joint probability distribution, such that this independence behavior minimizes KL divergence to the true distribution that they would have if you would consider all interactions. Why is this called mean field? Because it mediates the effect of all the other particles under these potentially super complicated interaction terms solely by this object here. And this object, as we know from the previous slide, let me just go one slide back, this object is an average over the two joint distribution under all the other uh, distributions of the particles. So it's a mean of the joint field under all the other distributions of the, all, the, all the other particles. And it's the only way that it creates kind of mediation terms between all the particles with each other. So we could, we could think of um, every individual particle behaving completely independently on its own in a potential that is only driven by these mean interaction terms. But that's just an aside. If you see somewhat the term mean field theory, you know that it's essentially fact, uh, variational approximations where the approximation is imposed solely by factorization assumptions. There's also sometimes in the literature the case that mean field theory applies to or m implies that we're taking a maximal factorization. So we're really assuming that everything is completely independent of everything else. But what exactly that means is um, dependent on uh, like a definition right, of what the individual variables are. So we'll, we'll actually get to see an example of this. With that, we've actually done the hard part, the derivation. We've arrived at our final tool. We haven't applied it to anything yet. We'll need to do that in the next, next lecture. That'll be our job for the entire next lecture, doing concrete examples of how this works. Today, or for this, this lecture, was the, the derivation of this algorithm. Variational inference, the final tool in our toolbox, is a general framework for constructing approximating probability distributions that approximate the true posterior arising from a generative model by minimizing the KL divergence between the approximation and the true posterior under some imposed constraints on what the approximation is. It's a very powerful framework because what I just said leaves us with a lot of options for how to construct this approximation. If we don't put any constraints on Q, then, well, we know what the, what the minimization process will give us, the true posterior. Now, in, in general, we won't be able to do that. But the variational framework, the uh, calculus of variations, 
allows us to sometimes only impose very vague constraints, like, for example, the assumption that Q only factorizes in a particular way without explicitly stating what the terms of the factorization are. We've just seen that when we do this, then the, the framework tells us, and this is the operation, operational equation of this framework, that we should set our approximating Q over the variable subset indexed by J to the expectation under all the other terms in the factorized approximation of the log of the joint. This term here, this expected value of the log of the joint under all the other approximations is called the mean field and therefore the resulting approximations are called mean field approximations. We will see next lecture that even though this is such an abstract statement, it's actually possible to realize in practice. And it's particularly straightforward if we use exponential family distributions in P in our generative model. Why, you can maybe already guess, well, because then the log of P will consist of relatively simple terms that are linear in the, um, in, the, in the parameters of the model, and all we need to compute, quote unquote, is the um, expected value under the approximation of the sufficient statistics of our exponential family distribution. And quite often, these approximations are possible to compute in closed form, and they give us a function that explicitly tells us what Q actually is. So now I've used the word explicit and tractable quite a lot, but of course everything we've done so far is still very vague and abstract. And to make it concrete, to make it a tool that you actually know and understand how to use, we have to apply this framework to a concrete problem. For example, to the Gaussian mixture model and to our topic model, to close the circle and come back to our running example. When we do so, you'll see that variational approximations are a very powerful tool that can be applied to a large class of, of models, you will also find that they require a lot of manual work to do derivations and to implement them in practice on a concrete problem. Variational approximations are therefore, in practice, not the kind of tool you want to use when you first design uh, a generative model. We've seen, we've also done this in our topic model example, that in such situations, you may prefer to use a smaller subset of your data and run, let's say, for example, a Monte Carlo, Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm to get a first idea of um, what the model looks like, what its predictions look like. But variational approximations tend to be significantly more efficient than sampling because they turn inference into an optimization problem and still return a full posterior. We'll see how to do this in our practical examples and then add this as the kind of a, the high performance tool that you might employ in a, in a finished product to get really fast, reliable, stable, and quite efficient uh, probabilistic inference at nevertheless relatively high fidelity. You'll see how we do this in practice in the next lecture. I invite you to go there and uh, see how the derivations actually work out in practice. For now, we're done with this lecture though. Thank you very much for your attention.